Okay, folks, so we need to talk about three violent things. Number one, what the Fed FOMC meeting minutes that were just released a few moments ago say. There are really just two big highlights that I want you to take away from it, and then we can move on. Number two, I'm going to walk you through some new data that has just come out and some new red flags that indicate where this economy and this market is heading. And then lastly, number three, I want to walk you through the freaky reason that energy prices have finally started tanking and what that means in terms of turning a new chapter in this crisis. Now, folks, before we even get into it, I have to tell you that I would love to come out with a video today that says, oh, the sun is about to come out. It's going to be all berries, roses, and sunshine. So put on your SPF 2000 because the S&P is going to 5000. But unfortunately, it's going to look a lot more like this for the foreseeable future. Maybe you get a sunny day or a sunny week here or there, but there is still that general storm advisory that is going to be active for quite some time. I'm not so bearish that I believe that the storm will never pass. In fact, yesterday I gave a bunch of reasons why I believe eventually it will pass. But while we're in a storm, we have to acknowledge that yes, this is a storm. Yes, we have to be prepared. And yes, we need to stay informed on what the heck is going on. So timestamps below and let's get to work. Also, I do want to give a warm welcome Welcome to all of our new Zip Trader U members. We have had the biggest increase in new members that we've seen all year, and many folks have taken advantage of our 4th of July sale, and I am extremely excited to welcome all of you to the team. I also want to announce that we have gone ahead and extended our America 50 50% 50 off coupon code on the program to this Friday, which means that if you are on the fence or you haven't had a chance to look over the program yet, you have a couple more days. Remember, coupon code America50, link down below. Okay, let's go ahead and start with the Fed. So if you remember, back on June 15th, the last FOMC meeting, the Fed made the last minute decision to be even more hawkish with rate hikes, given the higher than anticipated inflationary reports that came out slightly before that meeting. And they decided to go with the largest rate hike since 1994. And the minutes today revealed what went into that process and most importantly, what we're going to see in terms of future hikes. At the top right column on page nine of the minutes released just a few moments ago, it says, quote, participants concurred that the economic outlook warranted moving to a restrictive stance of policy and they recognized the possibility that an even more restrictive stance could be appropriate if elevated inflation pressures continued to persist. Okay, so think about this. The meeting that they said this at, they decided to go with a 75 basis point hike. And they are saying here at that same meeting that, hey, we recognize the possibility of an even more restrictive stance if elevated inflation pressures were to persist. In other words, we could very well see more than a 75 basis point hike in a single meeting, maybe 100, maybe 125. Now, the reason that this is actually shocking is because Jerome Powell came out right after that original FOMC meeting and gave a press conference where he basically said, hey, yes, we're doing a 75 basis point hike now in reaction to inflationary data, but this is going to be rare. He used the word rare. Well, it turns out in that very same meeting, they were saying, no, actually, hey, this might not even be rare. We might actually get even more restrictive. Now, I am all for ripping the Band-Aid off. Eventually, it has to happen. But damn, is the Fed bad at communicating what it's going to be doing and what its intentions are. And pay close attention to the wording here. Quote, could be appropriate if elevated inflation pressures were to persist. So the qualifier for a more restrictive policy is simply elevated inflationary pressures continuing to exist. So reading between the lines here, what does that really mean? Well, it means that inflation does not have to continue to spiral. It just has to stay elevated and persistent, which means it could plateau at a high rate. And all of a sudden the Fed has their justification to get even more restrictive than the 75 basis point hikes. In my opinion, this is actually a lot more hawkish of a statement than the market may be even factoring in. I think the Fed here is basically saying, hey, we at the Fed are ready to put our big boy Powell pants on and try a decent amount harder to get this thing under control. If I had seen them say this statement here when I gave my criticism of Powell video back when he originally released his announcement, I probably would have been a little bit easier on them. They were certainly at least a step or two more hawkish than I had thought they were and I think that markets think they are. Before this meeting, a 75 basis point hike was barely on the table. Fed was basically saying it was unlikely to happen even if inflation remained hot. Now they're basically saying that we could see a lot more than that even if inflation just barely stays elevated. So it certainly shows that the Fed is actually willing to get their hands a lot more dirty. And I think the reason why is because of this page nine second column on the right paragraph. Listen to this. Quote, many participants judged that a significant risk now facing the committee was that elevated inflation could become entrenched 
if the public began to question the resolve of the committee to adjust the stance of policy as warranted. Okay, so they are saying with inflation getting so out of hand and our recent history of misjudging and underdefending against inflation again and again and again, they are saying, hey, basically we're losing our soft power here to tighten markets without actually tightening them. Remember, the Fed has both hard power and soft power. Hard power is, of course, unloading of balance sheets and raising of interest rates. The soft power is signaling to the market that over the next year or two, it's going to be doing those things. If the market trusts what the Fed signals, the market goes and tightens on its own and the Fed doesn't have to step in as much and the overall problem solves itself a lot faster. The Fed can act without actually acting, just communicating its actions. However, if the market starts routinely thinking that the Fed is going to under attack inflation and under respond to inflation at every single turn, then the market starts losing trust in the Fed and it becomes advantageous for the market to go and not tighten as much. Now, of course, when I'm talking markets, I'm not necessarily referring to equity markets. I'm referring to the overall credit and financial system. But basically the point is this paragraph is saying, hey, the Fed needs to regain its soft power and it needs to do that by asserting its hard power. So in the future, if the Fed wants to achieve this goal of regaining public trust and strengthen its commitment to actually bring down inflation, well, it's going to have to raise rates more aggressively than the market is currently pricing in. And for the next meeting, markets are already anticipating a nearly 90% chance of a target rate at 225 to 2.5, which is another 75 basis point hike from the current range. So if the Fed really wants to make good on its statements, it needs to raise at least 100 basis points at the meeting at the end of this month. And will they do it? Well, markets don't really seem to think so. The immediate market reaction was meh, whatever. There's not a lot new that came from these meeting minutes. This time around, the Fed has tried to signal that they're going to be even more hawkish, but markets, I don't think they really believe it. Jerome Powell is a relaxed and single parent that lets the kid, the economy, basically do whatever it wants. Gives it chocolate and caffeine and it's spinning around all night, but eventually there's going to be consequences for that. And Jerome Powell can't do the minimum to discipline that economy. He needs to come out and put his foot down or this is going to continue to be a troublesome trend. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the new data. You've now had the Atlanta Fed's GDP estimator go from projecting positive growth in Q2 to now negative. And we talked about that last week, but now it's moved even farther negative. Before it said negative one, now it says negative 2.1%. And the official read on Q2 comes out July 28th, a day after the next Fed meeting. If it is negative, we'll be officially declared in a recession. That is going to be a freaky deaky week. Imagine if the Fed decides to be more hawkish and then the next day, all of a sudden, hey, he's getting more hawkish into a officially declared recession. Of course, the quarterly GDP reports, the original ones, tend to be a little bit more biased to the upside. For Q1, for example, you had a contractionary quarter, but then it turned out that after a few revisions, it was even more contractionary than we had thought. So I wouldn't be surprised if Q2 is the same, but still something to know about. And you go over to the yield curve, which you should yield before you look at. But as of right now, the much looked at curve of two and 10 year yields has now inverted not just once, but twice. An inverted yield curve happens when short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, which means that markets are pricing in a high likelihood of a recession, a high chance that short-term lending is more dangerous and more risky than long-term lending, and thus the higher rate, which is usually the opposite of a healthy market, right? And yield curve inversions have historically predicted every single recession since World War II. According to Bespoke, when the yield curve inverts, there has been a better than two-thirds chance of a recession at some point in the next year and a greater than 98% chance of a recession at some point in the next two years. We are now on the second inversion in this cycle. And I know that we talked about this back in April the first time it inverted, but a yield curve basically inverts when markets start growing really unconfident about the Fed's ability to control inflation without destroying the economy and forcing a recession. So at least when you're looking at what markets are saying right now, they're screaming, hey, we don't trust it. We just don't trust it. Too dangerous. Next, I want to talk to you about jobs, the big J word. Here's the thing. You see headlines like this, quote, job openings fell in May, but still outnumber available workers by almost two to one. This particular one is from CNBC. And the inclination here is that, hey, yes, the job market is cooling down, but there's still way, way more available workers than there are jobs. So that's fine. But think about this for a second. So job openings are trending down rapidly. While the Fed has only started tightening and inflation hasn't come down yet, and we're supposed to be okay with that because there's still a lot of jobs right now. But what happens when the same forces that are killing the available job openings now continue to kill 
these openings until there are no job openings left, or at least less job openings than there are people looking for jobs. What about all the companies in pretty much every sector of the economy that may have not started laying off people or are even thinking about that yet, but have completely frozen hiring? What about all the jobs that have actually been lost that are just being overshadowed in the overall numbers by an increase in jobs in things like hospitality, which are still seeing a boost? Every single time you cool off from a hot economy, you're going to be cooling off from a healthier relative baseline. But the accelerating forces that are causing the trend to now cool down are not going to magically stop when you get an equal amount of jobs to people looking for them. No, it's going to keep getting worse. Forces that are causing the slowdown, the increase in commodity prices, and as of late, the more and more hawkish Fed. Well, the first force is still being very, very stubborn, and the second force is just starting to be hawkish. That's why you're just at the beginning of this trend. I see so many analysts saying, oh, yes, things are contracting, but last year was so positive, so we just can't possibly be in a recession this year. Oh, yeah, you know, the bread lines are just starting. They're pretty low right now, and we just came back from the roaring 20s, so there's just nothing to worry about. The problem is the conditions that forced us to have this insanely tight labor market were basically phony BS artificial demand pumped by the Fed and by Congress. And over the short to medium term, that is no more. And in fact, in the case of the Fed, it's being pulled. But seriously, Charlie Charlito, how can unemployment be so low and we can still be heading for a recession? Doesn't make sense. You can't have a recession if unemployment is low. Charlie, well, remember, unemployment is a lagging indicator. Companies start seeing less and less economic activity before they start dropping people, right? You don't fire people before you see less spending, right? That doesn't make any sense. You first stop hiring, and then, if necessary, you start laying people off. Right now, you're just really seeing a broad freezing of hiring. Certainly, there has been some layoffs and some firing, but overall in the economy, it's mostly freezing right now. So the data on unemployment is very, very lagging. Since 1948, the unemployment rate hit its lowest point at an average of 4.3%, and then within the next year, a recession started. The only exception was in 1989, where it took like 15 months to start a recession, but still, most of the time, pretty fast and much faster than that. And overall, the unemployment rate the month a recession started averaged at 4.7%, which wasn't a huge difference on average between the low at 4.3%. So right now, we are in this extremely tight labor market, and unemployment is at, what, 3.6%. And the Fed has started prioritizing price stability over employment. They have signaled very clearly that our focus now is on price stability, not employment. We think the labor market is very, very tight, so it's time that we focus on inflation. Inflation is the bigger problem now. Which means what? Well, it means the trough in terms of unemployment in the cycle is about where we are right now. Now, historically, recessions tend to start between 0.3% of the unemployment trough. And in fact, in about seven Six of the last 12 recessions, unemployment troughed under 4% like we are now before shortly after falling into a recession within the next 12 months. Now take a look at this chart for a better picture on what I'm trying to say. This showcases the unemployment rate since 1945 and notice a clear pattern here. Unemployment rates do not find a low at the beginning of a recovery. They almost always find a low at the very end of it. Why? Well, because a recession increases unemployment dramatically, the Fed and Congress come in and pump the economy, and then boom, over time, employment goes back down. But eventually, there's a side effect of trying to run the economy at 100 miles per hour. Inflation or some other structural issue or some big economic calamity happens, and the economy going 100 miles per hour crashes, falls, and explodes. It tends to be the case that the economy goes the fastest and unemployment is at its lowest right before it reverses rapidly into a recession. A labor market that's historically tight has historically marked a period of time where you're just about to enter into a labor market that is extremely weak. So when you hear someone say, oh, you know, the unemployment rate is way, way too low for us to have any chance of a recession, well, either they are gaslighting you or they are just not looking at this last 50 years of data. The fact that we are near record low unemployment while inflation is at 40-year highs is testament to the fact that the economy has been running so damn fast that it can't breathe. Lastly, let's get oiled up because it's time to talk about oil prices. There are some good and bad things happening here. 
So oil prices are dumping. Dumping may be too strong a word, but they've gone back to early April levels. And that's a great development. One of the biggest indicators of a turning of a chapter in this crisis is oil prices peaking and coming down. Now, I'm not going to say that we're there yet, but of course, there are two possible reasons that oil prices can go down. One of them is very good. One of them is very bad. The first reason oil prices could go down is because the supply of oil is increasing, whether that's producers producing more oil or Russia ending their war in Ukraine, whatever it is oil supply increasing and while production and supply is getting better at a snail's pace that's still not the reason that oil prices are dropping the main reason that oil prices are dropping is because of that dirty r word recession according to fortune Citigroup came out and said crude oil could collapse to 65 dollars a barrel by the end of the year and possibly even slump to 45 dollars by the end of 2023 if a recession brings on a destruction in the demand for energy right now prices are at 98 if they went down to 65 or or 45, oof, that would be great. Now, this is an interesting take because it's one of the first times that a major bank was seriously considering that an incoming recession would be bad enough to take down demand so hard that it fixes our overpriced oil problem. And there's really two major narratives fighting out right now and trying to factor themselves in to oil prices and oil risk. The emerging one is the Citigroup narrative. And the other one is this JP Morgan narrative that says that global oil prices could reach a stratospheric $380 a barrel if Russia were to retaliate against sanctions. So here you have two different sides. One side is saying basically, hey, we're heading into a recession that's going to be so bad that oil demand is going to drop substantially off a cliff and oil prices are going to come down as a result. The other side is saying, hey, actually Russia is going to retaliate so heavily that the supply of oil on a global supply chain is going to be reduced so much that oil prices are going to go up like 3x plus what they are today. If oil prices go up 3x what they are today, we're going to be spending a lot more of our overall GDP and purchasing power on oil, which basically guarantees a massive stagflationary recession. So both situations, you get a massive recession. And right now, markets are kind of betting that the first scenario is going to be more true. And of the two evils, it's definitely much, much better if the first scenario does come true. In fact, the faster that oil prices drop in preparation for a recession, the softer the blow of an actual recession is going to be, the less the Fed is going to have to crank down on inflationary pressures because the less aggressive they're going to be and the faster that we can see the other side of this. So if the narrative that oil demand is going to be destroyed continues to get priced into oil prices today, that can actually really help the economy by reversing how painful it's going to be when we're actually in a recession. Anyways, folks, that caps off today's video. Make sure to hit that ravishing like button and subscribe if you want to keep up to date and informed. Coupon code AMERICA50 on ZipTraderU will still get you 50% off our program and lifetime access for that one-time fee. We extend it so it now expires on Friday. And if you want to get up to 10 free stocks with our link to Moomoo down below, make sure to check them out if you haven't already. Very good trading app and 10 free stocks is one of the best deals in the industry. I think it might be the best deal in the industry. I've never seen a trading app do 10 free stocks before. So it seems like a pretty good opportunity to try something new. Have a good one folks and we'll see you in the next video.